high school. This morning, I want to start out with a short little story about two sisters named Anna and Heather. Now, Anna got straight A's. She sang in the school choir and she prided herself on being involved in church. Anna's sister, Heather, loved playing sports and hanging out with friends but did the least she could get away with in school. Her parents sometimes talked to Heather about her goals for the future, but Heather assured them she'd figure that out later. Anna knew her parents didn't have favorites, but she was pretty sure that they were just a little more proud of her. She was the one who stayed home to help paint the porch while Heather went to the amusement park. She was the one who cooked and delivered lunch and dinner when Aunt Margaret broke her leg. Well, Saturday night before the annual family road trip, Anna stayed up working on a college application while Heather stayed out far past her pre-trip curfew. When Anna headed to bed, she found her mom still waiting up. When her mom woke her up at 5 a.m. to start packing the car, Anna blurted out, are you gonna ground Heather? Somehow, being grounded in the middle of family vacation sounded like a particularly fitting punishment to Aunt Anna. But her mom just said, Heather and I have talked and have made some decisions. And frankly, Anna, it's none of your business. Anna grumbled to herself as she put on her slippers. Why did their parents have to let Heather get away with everything? You know, sometimes in our lives, we can get in situations like this, right? Where we feel like somebody's playing favorites or leaving us out. You know, we do all the right things we feel like, and then somebody else gets the good reward. I don't know about you, but I've felt that way sometime in the past. Although sometimes those feelings probably aren't grounded on good principle. But what do we do when we feel this way? How do we react? What are some of those thoughts that come through our mind that make us think that our enemies deserve punishment and that when they receive mercy that it's not fair? Today, I want to tell you a little bit of the story, a story that's probably pretty familiar to you. So what we're going to do in the storytelling this morning is we're going to go through the first three chapters of the book of Jonah. And we're going to do it pretty quick because I want us to focus on the fourth chapter. So let's remind ourselves about the story of Jonah. So Jonah, in Jonah chapter one, so I'm going to be reading from our lesson today and I'll have that link in the description of the video down below. But it says this in the end to the story section, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. But Jonah ran away and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind. And the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. The lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? And he said, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord. So they asked him, What shall we do? to you to make this sea calm down for us. Pick me up, throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the, man feared, the men feared greatly and feared the Lord and made vows. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the deep, in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah out onto dry land. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time and said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Jonah went to Nineveh, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from greatest 
to the least, put on sackcloth and ashes. God saw that they turned from their evil way, and he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The story is almost upside down, right? Most of the time in the Bible, we hear about a prophet who calls uh, a people back to God or he calls them to repent from their sins. And it's usually the prophet who's proclaiming this good message of salvation. And it's the people who kind of waver one way or the other. But the Bible almost flips us upside down on this. It's the prophet who, who won't follow through with the command that God's giving him. The prophet runs away from God and God has to pull him back. You know, and when the prophet's running away, you think these, these nasty sailors, you know, we always hear about sailors and their ability to use foul language. And they're the ones who make a commitment to God after they toss Jonah over the railing. Upside down, right? Not what you expected. If you were the first time you've ever heard the story and you heard, knew the background to what's going on, you'd kind of be like, wow, what's going on here? And then even when Jonah goes and proclaims this message to the king of Nineveh, they repent quickly. They realize that they're in the wrong, that they've been violent and they've been living, living evil lives and they proclaim a fast and the citywide transformation. I mean, what a successful evangelist Jonah is. But let's turn our attention to the fourth and final chapter of Jonah where the Bible takes this story that's turned upside down in comparison to what we would expect and allows us to see this discussion between Jonah and God. You know, God submits to us and he asks, you know, is it fair that I do the things that I do? Oftentimes when we think about the story of Jonah, we think about judgment and how God called judgment down on Nineveh, but then relented and gave them mercy. So this balance between judgment and mercy. And God allows us to enter the conversation with him. Because God is the one who's on trial here. Is his judgment fair? And in chapter 4, we're going to see Jonah and God enter into this fascinating conversation about, is God fair? Jonah 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Head knowledge without heart knowledge is worse than useless. But when head and heart join forces, it changes our lives forever. David Jeremiah said that. In his anger... Jonah prays an honest prayer. He actually tells God what's going on in his heart through what's going on in his mind. Jonah asks for death a second time. He told the sailors, throw me overboard in order to save their life. Jonah didn't know the fish was going to be there. He thought it'd be better for him to just drown, to end his misery. God had saved his body in that big fish, but he hadn't saved his heart just yet. Jonah thought he was familiar with God's judgment, right? Why else would he have to be in the belly of a fish for three days? But where Jonah saw God executing judgment on him, God was working in mercy to save him and now to save the city of Nineveh through him. God's going to give Jonah a very powerful object lesson in the next part of our story. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. 
But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Wow, Jonah is exposed here for having more sympathy and wanting to give more mercy to this inanimate object, that plant, than for the people he held in nationalistic prejudice. Jonah looked at these people as his enemies, but God wanted to expand Jonah's perception of how far his mercy could reach. And in the New Testament, Paul tells us that there's no longer Jew, nor Greek, nor free, nor slave, nor male, nor female, but everyone are together brothers and sisters in Christ. So for us today, there can't be these barriers that hold us back from us extending and rejoicing that our enemies receive mercy. We don't see any evidence from the text to tell us whether Jonah understood or whether his brain clicked on the illustration with the plant. But God gave him one last notion of how far his considerations and his mercy goes. He said at the end of the chapter there, I don't know if you caught it, but he said there's 120,000 people within that city who don't know their right hand from their left. Now I want you guys to practice with me, all right? On the count of three, I want you to raise your one, two, three, right hand. Good job. All right, ready? On the count of three, one, two, three, left hand. Good job. Now, Jonah wasn't talking about people like you because you know your right hand from your left hand. And he wasn't talking about people who were stupid because even people without a first grade education might know what their, you know, their right hand to their left hand is. So who was Jonah talking about? I want you to figure that one out on your own this week. Who doesn't know their right hand from their left hand? God shows himself here to be a shelter for the vulnerable and a protector for the innocent. I want to investigate one last story. We saw an example of where somebody allowed their prejudice to get in the way of understanding how far God's mercy can reach. But I want to see a good example. Turning your Bibles with me this morning to Acts chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 16 through 34. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. 
About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Imagine you were there with Paul in that prison. Imagine you were Silas, right? Paul had been singing and praising all night, and you just praise and sing right there with him. You feel the earthquake. You see the doors shake, and the doors just fall off their hinges. And you turn to Paul, and you're like, let's... And the look on Paul's face says something completely different. You know, Paul, he's not a rightful prisoner. Maybe God had pervaded a way of escape. Come on, Paul, let's go. How do we know that Paul wasn't looking to save himself in the situation? Paul's reaction makes it seem that he wasn't surprised by the earthquake or by any of this at all. Paul knew that he didn't need to escape from a prison because he was confident that someone stronger than prison walls stronger than prison guards, stronger than the magistrate and the mob that had beaten them and put them in this situation, he knew that someone who was stronger than all these things had declared Paul an absolutely free man. He had been freed from the selfishness that makes us want to sustain ourselves above everyone else, to look for ways of escape constantly. That mindset had been put to death. That mindset wasn't in Paul. He now lived with the anticipation and expectation that everybody who the Spirit brought him in contact with was just a simple decision away from becoming transformed into his brothers and sisters. He, he, he prayed for this to happen. He anticipated it. And he was able to rejoice in the reality of these things happening to him day in and day out. That's what the book of Acts is all about. It's about Paul who had set aside his needs to go look for brothers and sisters, to look, go look for children of God, and to declare, you've been set free. How did this happen? We're going to look for one more section of the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 5, to find if we can figure out what changed in the mind of Paul. So you're there with me. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to start out in verse 14. It reads, For Christ's love compels us. We're not compelled by guilt, or we're not compelled by a, a sense of that it's the right thing to do. The love of Christ drives us by the most persuasive of arguments. And that argument is that the creator of all the universe came and lived like his creation. That's what compels us. The love of Christ who would come and live on planet earth. It continues. It says, because we are convinced. We are convinced. So the love of Christ gets to my heart. It compels me. But we're convinced as well. Christ also speaks to our mind. We're convinced that one died for all. Therefore, all died. Hmm. Get a little bit theological here, but it says one died for all. Therefore, all have died because he, that's Jesus, died for all. And why? Why did Jesus die? So that those who 
who were once dead, who died with Christ, are now alive in Christ, no longer live for themselves. So right there it says, they no longer live for themselves, but live for Jesus who also lives. Jesus, the one who the grave couldn't hold. He, he came back to life and he wants to give that life to you. And he, he, his life lives in me, in the life of the Christian. We don't have to serve selfishness anymore because Christ died for me, but he also died for all. So that's what's, that's what's going to change for us. It's not that, that Jesus just died for me, but we get to see in everybody around us that Christ also died for them. And get this, whether they've accepted it yet or not, it doesn't change that Christ has paid that price for them and changes the way we see the world. So let's, let's go to the next verse. Verse 16, we have stopped evaluating others from a human standpoint. So what has changed? The way we evaluate, the value system I use to see others. Previously, through selfish eyes, the value system I looked at was how can you serve me or how does my interaction with you best accomplish my selfish goals, right? But I'm blessed. Jesus has changed my heart. He, I died with him. I let, because of what Jesus did for me, because the love that compels me and then the fact that he convinced me that he died for me, I can let self die so that he can live through me, so that now I don't evaluate people by what they can do for me. I evaluate them and I see the value that Christ put on them. And what's the, that value? He died for them on Calvary. His life, the life of the creator of the universe is the value system that now I can operate with other people in my life. The verse says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. However, we know him now. But this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. The love of Christ compels me. It persuades me. It drives me. And how does it drive me? It drives me because it convinces me up here that Christ died for me and for everybody. And he allows me to live the life that he lived, right? So it changed my value system. I don't evaluate people through just human terms anymore, but I see people as Jesus sees them, as his sons and daughters, as part of this family together. So all that being said, I get to enter into this partnership with Jesus. And we find that partnership in verse 18. It says, God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Because I get to see the world through his eyes, because us as Christians, you and me, have accepted Christ into our lives, we don't see people the way that we saw them before. We see him the way he sees them. And now we get to partner with him. We get to reunite children with their loving parents. And that's what the Bible is trying to tell us. This overarching theme isn't a way that Christ can take sinners and bring them into heaven. It's a loving parent whose children have been deceived and lied to and separated from him. And he is going to rescue them. That's what the Bible is about. A God who is who is so eager to rescue us from this selfishness that we live in. You know, at the beginning of our time together, I told you that story about Anna and Heather. And if you remember, Anna struggled with seeing her sister Heather receive mercy. I don't want to be like Anna in that I don't understand the mercy of my parent. I want to be someone who understands my Heavenly Father's mercy so much. I want it to be so real to me in my heart and in my life. He invites me to come alongside him and partner with him 
to reconcile the world to himself. The, the next, I mean, read verse 19 and verse 20 of 2 Corinthians 5. Like, we become the appeal to the world that God loves them. I don't want to be like Jonah who misunderstands God's mercy, who can't see how God can love his enemies. But instead, I want to be like Paul who eagerly anticipates that anybody who the Spirit brings in my connection, I can partner with God and just play a small role in reconciling them and bringing them back together, reuniting the family. I don't know about you, but I love Jesus because he came after me. He used so many people in my life. He used my parents. He used my siblings. He used pastors, teachers. He used complete strangers, people on college campuses. He's probably even used you to convince me that he loves me he doesn't want to spend another day apart from me. So my challenge to you today, you got the Bible open, 2 Corinthians chapter 15, chapter 5, verses 14 all the way through the end. It's like 20 something. I want you to read that over and ask Jesus to make those words a reality for you this morning. To ask him to write those words on your heart that he'll compel you by his love. He'll convince you that he died for you and for everybody you come in contact with. He'll change the way that you evaluate the world, the way that you evaluate other people, and that he's inviting you to partner with him in this awesome work of reconciliation. That's Powerheads. Dear Jesus, thank you for seeing value in me and coming to live like me on this planet earth. Heavenly Father, thank you for reconciling the world to yourself, reconciling me to you and bringing me back and convincing me of your love. Jesus, send the Holy Spirit. Send your spirit to be with those who are listening now. May they read these words, not as some foreign old text, but as a personal narrative of a God who loves them so much. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Have a great Sabbath day. Hope you can get outside today and enjoy nature and family and friends. We'll see you next week.